Anyway, but we have a, with the, <clears throat> we have our own, we had a beautiful example of the confusion which still exists. The confusion between oxygenation and ventilation <laughs> are two different birds. I think he knows. Hmm? I'm sure he knows. So, very rapidly, venous arteria, because I never use venous arteria, because we don't have a cardiac assisted and so on. Uh, but we have uh, two uh, really important things that I think are a little bit under-considered. is the lung hyperperfusion and, uh, and the blood uh, black flow, when it depends when you put the, the, um, the cannula. This is lung hyperperfusion, which are the consequences? So you have uh, from venous side to the arterial side, depending on the blood flow that you use, uh, you have uh, a corresponding hyperperfusion to the lung. Problem, what kind of ventilation to use? What kind of pressure to put in? And uh, this is very, usually it's quite ignored, uh, this kind of thing. You see the people put the membrane lung, gas flow, Blood flow, uh, put something on the ventilator, 10, uh, tidal volume, 6 per kilo, uh, 10, uh, peep of 10, uh, see you later and uh, see what's happened tomorrow. Which is really, uh, is difficult for me to understand uh, this kind of approach. Because I'm playing with the uh, best corporal circulation since at the times of Kolobov of Zeppel. I started in uh, 75, 76 at the time when Kolobov was developing the carbon dioxide membrane lung because the ECMO trial with Zeppel was already a failure. We are speaking about venous arterial. The trial of Zeppel, how was done? The ECMO trial, the famous one with 90% mortality in the control, 90% mortality in the treatment. Venus venous or venous arterial? was venous arterial. And my young collaborator said, what? And how the lungs were ventilated? Exactly in the same way, in the control and in the treated, with one difference. Which was the difference? The FiO2. Because the devil at that time was the high FiO2. So the venous arterial was done in this study and uh, this study killed the extracorporeal support for at least 34 years until the peaks uh, in the New Zealand uh, and Australia for the H1N1 with the same evidence that we had the 34 years ago. So, why we use extracorporeal support? Oxygenation and CO2 removal. Now, oxygenation and CO2 removal had a completely different requirement. To oxygenate, we need blood flow. We don't need any ventilation. It's enough to put an amount of oxygen equal to the oxygen consumed. I can keep an animal for days or months and we keep uh, men also, and women, uh, in this way, uh, because uh, be careful with the gender, no? because uh, men, it's terrible. So men and women, humans, okay, humans. Uh, and uh, we don't need any ventilation, but uh, you need a good uh, blood flow. For CO2 removal, because we have a lot of CO2 in the blood, uh, we need uh, high ventilation, and very low blood flow. And this, uh, I think, 1983, 82, uh, this is an example how to provide VO2 of 250, VCO2 of 200, uh, the requirement you have seven liters, one liter and 10, and the beautiful, with the extra corporal support, uh, you can dissociate these two functions. Was a, uh, VAR no, was, was, was speaking about uh, Professor Noon. Professor Noon is uh, this unbelievable book, the first uh, edition. 
I was in Amsterdam. The first time I presented the, this diaper it was a Professor Noon uh, and said, okay, clap, clap. At the end, Professor Noon came to me and say, said, Dr. Gattinoni, I have to compliment you, are a genius, but where did you get this? He said, from your book. Because, <laughs> because Noon was a perfect, but is the British, without, complete, without any sense of humor I ever met, but more famous for that. But really, if you look this, if you, if you read this book, uh, everything becomes very clear. Now, we have to translate this basic concept in a clinical practice. While we have now the people, you treat a patient for hypoxemia, and you treat a patient with a tidal volume, take out all the CO2, put a tidal volume of 400, a peep of 10, and you ask, why? Why you do this kind of thing? Sit down, connect the brain, and try to, why? The reason why we do all this story, we do it for rescue. Oxygenation, and maybe hyperinflation. I perfectly agree with Mon Ami Villar, because until you have a good cardiac output, a good flow, you can have a 35 of PO2, 40 of PO2, who cares? There is no problem. We had a patient for one month with 35 of PO2 with perfect organ function, but the lung, that at the end recovered. Anyway, oxygenation is very rare, and then second is a buying time to maintain the life. And uh, still there is a big confusion because the people put uh, all the entry criteria for ECMO are based on oxygenation as at the time of Zeppel. The criteria are not very much changed. Now, if you look at the last study, no? the Alain Comp, the Eolia study, look please at the PO2s in the control group and in ECMO treated patients. ECMO treated with five liters per minute. And you see, oh, oh my God, the PO2 are exactly the same. So why you do that? The PO2 are exactly the same. And why this happen? So I would like to touch three or four points that are usually ignored in this uh, story. We have uh, the tissue, then we have uh, two system which are in series. Then we have the artificial lung and the ECMO. How many of you do ECMO? Please raise your hand. Great. Who uses in the membrane lung 100% oxygen? Nobody? At the beginning, when you have an ECMO, well, the people I know of, they all use other percent oxygen. Okay? So you put a lot of oxygen here, and then you have, you increase the oxygen content in as a little bit unphysiological to have a big oxygen amount coming in the venous size, and it goes in the natural lung. In the natural lung, the blood has two ways measurement. One is a part which receives oxygen from the, good, the baby lung working. The other part is the shunted area. Now, if I increase the saturation of oxygen here, how will be the oxygen transfer in the natural lung? Going down. So, the improvement of PO2 I have in a vino venous system is just due to the increase of saturation in the shunted blood. So anytime I increase the oxygen transfer here, that means I increase a lot oxygen consumption. Let's see, when I try to understand something, I try to put the reasoning at its limit. Let's see, I take all my blood, go through the artificial lung before to get in the natural lung. What will be the oxygen transfer in the natural lung? Zero. Because the oxygen is completely saturated. Okay. 
Now, how we work usually. Here is a, one of the classical examples of uh, uh, shunt compartment. White means no gas. We has a sample fusion inside. And you see, if I call the no gas part as an atomical shunt compartment, you see 20% of the lung is white or 30% is white, or 40% of white, the functional shunt, what I measure as a, with the shunt formula, or the PF that you like, stay constant. That means we have still a tremendous capability to divert the blood flow. And only at about 60%, we have some increase in shunt. The same thing is PO2 and FiO2. Stay here, boom down. Now, we arrive, uh, oh, oh, this patient is hypoxic, terrible hypoxia. PO2, FiO2 is minus 100. Put the cannulas, put the blood flow, and you give uh, uh, five liters. The cardiac output of the patient is seven liters. What I would expect if you take a pencil and you put uh, the thing together, I would expect the PO2 goes up more than 200. Never happen. You put a vino venus, a high flow vino venus, your PO2 maybe start with 50, and you have 53, 54, 55, well, who cares? I support oxygenation. Why? Because, uh, very simple, when the SVO2 goes up, the shunt increases. If the younger of you maybe rediscover the shunt and measure terrible things, the shunt before the connection and after the connection, maybe when we discover that before the connection, the shunt is 40%. After you put all the Ambaradan together, the shunt goes up to 70%. And this explains why the effect on PO2 are not so tremendous. Now, make sense all this effort to have this result, speaking about oxygenation. And this is an example of the PO2, which is stay exactly the same level, instead to go up. Well, uh, just a brief, brief uh, note, uh, reminder. Now, in, in Germany, I think about uh, only, if I remember correctly, less than 20% of the patients are put in prone position before to be connected in ECMO for hypoxia, which is absolutely nonsense. If you have problem with hypoxemia, the first thing to do, put the patient in prone position. 60-70% of the time, the PO2 goes up without changing, without cost, without many other things. Anyway, now, you have uh, absorption of electasis. Now, I have, uh, what is dangerous in for the lung? The tremendous villi. The villi, which sounds a sort of TNF of the lung. Huh? The villi is due to the high tidal volume, right? 12, my God, terrible. 6 is good, but if 6 is good, 4 would be better. 2? Well, why not? I ventilate a little bit the trachea. No? <laughs> and uh, when I decrease the tidal volume, I don't have problem with the ventilation. We have the PCO2 removal. But I don't have to forget the oxygenation, because the lung starts to go in reabsorption at electasis which are for two reasons. One are the doctor. And the second, the most, uh, even if you don't raise the hand, uh, most of the people use 100% oxygen in a membrane lung. If the 100% oxygen is used in a membrane lung, how much will be the partial pressure of nitrogen Nitrogen, this unknown gas, coming out from the membrane lung, lower, 
zero don't think because it depends, uh, but it's lower. So, to the main natural lung, it will arrive, let's see, I have 40% in the natural lung and 100% in the membrane lung. I have some concentration of, oxygen, of nitrogen in the natural lung, and to the natural lung arrive a blood with a concentration of, low, of nitrogen which is lower. So when the poor blood reach the alveoli, I have two kinds of gas transfer. Oxygen, compatible with the, amount, the difference in uh, saturation of hemoglobin, and uh, nitrogen. And if you take whatever book of physiology is written since decades, uh, then when you have this, uh, the alveoli shrink until reach a critical radius and then collapse. So the change in nitrogen is uh, a potential source of worsening of reabsorption of telectasis. And this, when I had, uh, I was even younger than some of you now, with Colabo, we play, I was here, yeah, I was playing, to change the natural lung concentration of gases by changing the concentration of gases in the membrane lung. We were keeping in a complete apnea the animals, and if I use or very high nitrogen or lower and lower and lower in the membrane lung. And the physics works. I was just changing the composition as I like it. So that means uh, this is not an invention. This happened. So if in a membrane line 100% out of blood and do down, less than two come into the natural line, reassertion of the letters. R, that's great. The respiratory quotient. <laughs> Another mystery of the life. Eh? That uh, I don't have time to derive exactly the respiratory quotient. It took me years to try to understand this. But uh, if you take the alveolar air equation, you see that uh, the PO2 in the alveoli depends on FiO2 times the pressure minus the pressure of the water vapor, minus 47. So FiO2 times 713 minus the other gas is PaCO2 divide R. As an example, if I have 140 of PaO2 and 40 of PCO2 and R is 1, the alveolar PO2 will be 100. What is the problem? But now let's see that as I am playing with extracorporeal support, I decrease a lot the expired CO2 from the lung. My R goes down terribly. And let's see, I have 0 0,5. Because the R is the ratio between VCO2 exhaled divide VO2. The VO2 continues like this. And I change the VCO2. If the R is 0 0.5, I have under 40 minus 40 divide 0 0.5, which means under 40 minus 80. How much is under 40 minus 80? 60. The best blood coming in this condition out of the natural lung would be equilibrated with 60 of, PCO, of PO2. And this happens during the weaning phases when the people start to disconnect the patient from the extracorporeal support. And you say the PCO2 goes down, so my God, PO2 goes down, so rise the peep. No, maybe it's just a look at how much is the R. But you understand, if you don't measure the thing, you will never imagine what is the cross-talking between the natural and artificial lung. This is an extreme situation. If I have a FiO2 of 0.3, uh, the, um, 
the PaO2 will be theoretically 14 millimeters of mercury. So, this has to be taken in consideration. And when you have an extracorporeal support without any movement, tidal volume, and you want to keep the PL2 arteria, the alveolar PO2 constant, we have only one gas available, 100% oxygen, which means that each molecule of oxygen will leave the, the, the blood, the, the natural lung, is replaced by one molecule of uh, oxygen. If I use 0 0.99, after a few hours, uh, I have a lot of nitrogen in the lung. And uh, at the end, the plateau. I have, uh, I decrease. Huh? I ventilate. 70 kilo men, 70 kilo men, uh, plateau, uh, let's see, I give a tidal volume of four, uh, 280. 280 means that the alveolar ventilation, if the alveolar the space would be zero, the anatomical space is about 150, means in the alveoli comes 130 milliliters of gas, which are very low. And when I have, you can imagine the lung, which a very low tidal volume, and maybe you have a little bit of secretion here, secretion there, the lung start to shrink. And we have only one thing to do, which is inside our physiology, the big breath. In the morning, when you wake up, and not only in the morning, we take a deep breath, and this is not, it does not have any gas exchange meaning, but to maintain the lung volume. Unfortunately, all the ventilator cancel the SIG function. While the SIG would be perfect. At this point, you can ventilate with three, liters, three milliliters per kilo. If every two minutes I give one side to keep the lung open, because these are the opening pressures. And I need to reach sometimes an opening pressure. And I would not have any fear to have 35, as an example, even in the psych, even in the patients, if it's done once every two minutes or once per minute. There is no problem. But I perfectly know that what is the relationship between the FRC and the tidal volume per kilo and the frequency. You see, what is important is, not, is irrelevant, it's 0, 6, 1, 2, or 4 per minute. It's important the size of the tidal volume. And as far as I know, has been just finished one uh, study introducing a sort of size that makes the result will be spectacular. But uh, remind that we need some expansion which is not the paranoia of the recruiting maneuver, 65, 45, 40 seconds, squeeze the lung, kill the patient, and so on. No, quite. So, remember that finally, ECMO, ECHO works only if membrane lung plus mechanical ventilation or spontaneous breathing less dangerous than mechanical ventilation alone. Before to connect somebody, I think we should uh, remember this statement. I thank you for the attention.